Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I am your host, and uh, I also am the uh, speaker giving the presentation. But as the Zoom host, I have some ground rules to explain to everyone. First of all, everybody needs to be muted. And at the end, after the presentation is over, uh, it will be all right to unmute yourself and we can have some interaction. But until then, if you have questions during the presentation, uh, put them in the chat section, type them in. And if you don't know what the chat, chat section is, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little talking bubble icon with the word chat under it. And if you click on that, it opens up a, a window on the right and you can type your message there to everyone. And um, Julianne will be watching uh, and making note of the questions. And if it's appropriate, uh, there will be a couple of sections as I switch from one trip to another. If someone has a specific question about a particular trip, then uh, she can relay that to me and, and I can answer it then or answer it at the end if it's just a general question. So. Uh, everyone must remain muted, uh, use the chat for questions. I do also want to say next month's um, outdoor photography is the top topic of next month's trail talk. And the other thing I want to mention is uh, I sent a reminder to everyone. If you didn't see it, check your spam folder because some I've, I've had a number of people for whatever reason are saying my emails are ending up in their spam folder. And it's important that you got that reminder because it has the link to the San Gregorio chapter YouTube channel, because we are recording this. And when the recording is done, uh, I will go through the process of getting it posted up on the YouTube channel within 24 hours. And uh, so if you have to leave uh, before the talk is over or something comes up, you can always watch it later at your convenience on YouTube. So at uh, this point, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Julianne. And I will, I guess I won't mute myself because I'm going to be talking again later. <laughs> that <it>. makes sense. <laughs> well, thanks, John. And, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really looking forward to John's program tonight. Uh, but let me introduce him properly. Our own John St. Clair has participated in numerous mule pack trips in the Eastern Sierra. And John has been an outings leader with the San Gregorio chapter since 2011, so a decade, a decade of leadership from John. Uh, he serves as the outings chair for the Los Serranos group and also serves on the Los Serranos executive committee and uh, helps to teach the San Gregorio chapter leadership training course, which is how uh, I got to know him. And John serves along with uh, Carla Kellums and, and, uh, and me uh, as the as members of the committee for Trail Talk. So, and uh, is the recipient along with uh, Carla and me of the Ralph Salisbury Award uh, this month for um, service uh, in outdoor leadership and in outings. So it was just a lovely award and uh, John has been super fabulous. Uh, it's been just essential to this whole effort. So congratulations. Uh, and with that, um, John, take it away and teach us about uh, mule packing. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of this floating command thing and then start the slideshow. Okay, so um, the topic is uh, mule pack trips in the Eastern Sierras. And the Angeles chapter of uh, Sierra Club has their own mule pack section. And they run uh, mule pack trips um, in the summer. And I'm going to give you some information about those trips. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is what you would see on their webpage right now. It says, sorry to say, but due to COVID, all 2021 mule pack trips have been canceled. But it also here has um, a pretty good uh, quick summary 
says the mule pack section conducts camping trips in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California lasting between four and seven days. Most trips start on the east side from Lone Pine in the south to Yosemite in the north. Because mules carry 40 to 55 pounds of each participant's gear, food, and supplies, you can enjoy the beauties and activities of the Sierras without the burden of a heavy backpack and with a greater variety of food, a larger tent, and other amenities not possible on a typical backpack. Each summer, you can choose from five day trips to different locations. On the first day, mules carry our gear while we hike separately to our selected campsite in a scenic wilderness area, typically at an elevation of nine to 11,000 feet. We set up our base camp and for the next several days, enjoy hiking, fishing, reading, relaxing, or whatever activity the participant chooses. So that's a pretty good summary. So um, this is a screenshot from 2017 of the mule pack section. And notice that summer, they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different mule pack trips. So they occur in late July, all the way through the end of August. And I've been told that this coming summer, they do expect to be able finally, after two years of no um, Sierra Club sponsored mule pack trips, uh, they expect to have two or three, not as many, um, but uh, there will be some. And uh, I will talk about how you can find out about that. So here is the uh, reservation policy. Basically, they announced the, the trips on the website usually in January. Now, this particular year, uh, this was updated for 2020, which actually didn't happen, uh, but you had until February 7th to mail in uh, or um, request to be part of a trip. You had to contact the specified leader with a statement of condition, experience, and altitude tolerance. And uh, as long as you got it in before February 7th, you had as good a chance as anybody else of being chosen. And uh, if you got it in after February 7th, you got put on a wait list. And actually, I know a number of people that have gotten to go, uh, even though they didn't get uh, chosen initially, but there's always some people that drop out for whatever reason. So they do uh, keep a wait list. And if you get on the wait list, you have a chance of um, getting in on a mule pack trip. So the, that summary, mentioned the the big draw for mule pack trips you don't have to carry a heavy backpack you get to be in the wilderness out in the and uh, beautiful sierras in the back country without having to carry all your gear and that's a big plus especially for someone my age who doesn't really want to carry a bunch of weight on my back and this is a map that shows, I, I did a search for California mule packs uh, stations. It doesn't show them all. In fact, I'm gonna talk about three different mule pack trips tonight and two of the three don't even show on here. <laughs> so um, basically, if you, you can see off to the right, there's that dotted line, that's the Nevada border. And the big marking line for these mule pack trips is the 395. The 395 goes north on the east side of the Sierras. And at every single town, or almost every single town, there is a road that goes up into the Sierras. And at the end of that road, there's a mule pack station. So there's, there's one in Lone Pine. There's one in Independence. Independence doesn't even show on the map. There's one at Big Pine. They show Big Pine, but they don't show a pack station. Uh, Bishop has two out of it um, and, and so on. So um, there are a lot of different mule pack stations and these are the ones that uh, have been used by the um, uh, Angeles chapter, the, the mule pack section, quite a few different uh, locations they've um, gone into to uh, spend a week hiking around. And I've done three of them. I've actually done five mule pack trips, but three of those five are at the same place, my favorite. 
So I've done Clark Lakes, I've done Humphrey Basin, and I've done Big Pine Lakes, Palisades Glacier. I'm gonna start, uh, oh, I, I'm gonna lay out the ground rules for how these things work. So basically what happens is you, uh, you get information about your mule pack trip and you have to supply some food for the community dinner. The lunch and the breakfast is completely on your own. You have to supply your own food for breakfast and lunch and you supply some food for the dinner. Every night we had hot soup with freshly chopped vegetables and um, sometimes with meat, sometimes with not because uh, vegetarians usually always have something to eat. And when you uh, actually get there, you get there early before the meal pack trip starts because you need to acclimate. Now that introduction, I said you, uh, the base camp is between nine and 11,000 feet. The three I've been on, one was at 11,000, the other two, well, one was at 10 and the other was 10,500. So that's high altitude. And so you have to acclimate yourself. So what people do generally is go up two days early and spend two nights at a motel. Some people uh, stay at a, a campground because they wanna save money. Uh, and a number of the mule pack stations have campgrounds close by. So you can do that. But you spend the first night, you, you drive up, spend the first night, then the next day you go on a warm up hike. Now, the warm up hikes are really nice hikes. This is this picture shows the Saddleback Lake warm up hike for the Clark Lakes mule pack trip. This is the high point of the hike. And my friend Rob took this picture of me with Saddleback Lake down below us. We started hiking at just about 10,000 feet and went up to about um, 12,000, be, between 11,500 and 12,000 feet was the high point. And so that was a warm up. And um, then you go back to where you were spending the night, spend a second night. And generally, the motel we stay at is about 8,000 feet. And that helps spending two nights at 8,000 feet. And then you get up the next morning very early and you take all of your gear to the pack station and dump it on the dock. Now you see those metal boxes on the right hand side. Those are paneer boxes and that's for storing the community food and personal food. Uh, in the middle of the pile, you might be able to see a bear canister. Some people choose to put their own personal food in a bear canister, but not everybody has one. And so your food can go in the paneer box with the community food. And uh, that's for safe storage. So after you drop the stuff off, you take off hiking. And um, generally speaking, the, the, uh, the mules will pass you on the way because it's a long hike. So the three I'm gonna talk about, uh, two of them are eight mile hikes and the other one was a nine mile hike. And you're going up from 8,000 to, uh, you know, uh, close to between 10 and 11,000. So the mules pass you up, you get off the trail and they go by. And generally speaking, they drop the stuff off before you get there. And um, this is the mule pack um, train there at the uh, Big Pines site. And I got there to take this picture. They hadn't unloaded. They got there before me, but they hadn't unloaded. And um, so we waited for them to unload. And then the this shows how much gear they carry. It's, it's amazing how much gear they carry. The metal boxes all have food in them. Or uh, actually this is stacked up to go back home. Cause so they drop it off and they come back five days later to pick it up. And you have to stack it up all nice and neat like this. And um, then you take off hiking back down and uh, you usually, we usually get back before the mules get back because it takes them a while to pack up all this stuff and they don't get up there until we're already well on our way down to their uh, 
to the mule pack station. So I want to point out something, a lot of big duffels. Uh, that's how most people carry their stuff. Uh, notice the bear canisters on the right hand side. Um, you can, and, and I usually bring a bear canister. And um, this is my bear canister. And it did not used to have those scratches in it because this past summer, I went to Big Pines and for the first time in my five years experience, we had a bear come into the camp. And the bear apparently knew that food was kept in these containers and it tried to open my bear canister. And, and if any of you who know what a bear canister like, it's a very, very hard plastic. The fact that the bear was able to claw and scratch those big gouges <laughs> is quite amazing. After he, he did that with mine, he went over to one of those big metal boxes and he started flipping it over end over end several times trying to pop it open and was not successful. And then people arrived back at camp and scared him off and he never came back again because he wasn't successful. And that's why you got to store your food in a safe way because if the bear is successful in getting food, they'll continue to come back and you don't want that to happen. So the very first thing you have to do when you get there is you have to set up the kitchen. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the kitchen being set up because it's a real big community project. I'm always holding one of the poles <laughs> and other, you know, so there's five poles. You gotta have a person at each pole. You've gotta have um, people with, uh, pulling out the guidelines with a hammer and hammering in the stakes. And um, it's a big effort to get that done. And, and I've never thought to take a picture, but this shows the kitchen after it is already set up. And you might notice uh, the one person's walking, looks like she's carrying a cutting board with chopped up vegetables on it. Um, every night, a, a big pot of soup with freshly chopped vegetables. And um, then with that is a salad bar. And there's also a happy hour before that with snacks. So people have to bring all that food and uh, everybody contributes food. Everybody contributes with the work. Uh, this is not uh, like hiking the Inca trail where you've got Sherpa like people doing all the work for you and fixing the food and, and you just sit back and relax. Everybody pitches in, which is actually good. Uh, it really gets people to know each other and, and it builds a big communal spirit. Uh, I never chop vegetables. Um, one thing I always do is I dig the sump hole because you have to have a hole for dumping the wastewater from washing the dishes and, and um, washing out the pots. And so, after I've helped with setting up the tent, the next thing I do is I start digging this deep hole to dump the liquid into. And then at the end of the, you know, the last day before we hike out, I fill it up uh, with dirt and that job is done. The other job that I do is uh, every base camp has to have a water source. And it's best if you're next to running water and the Big Pines, uh, uh, base camp is next to a nice running stream. Sometimes uh, so the Clark Lakes base camp was next to lakes, not a running stream that wasn't as good, but you got to have people that go collect the water. And um, the leader supplies two high grade filters uh, and bags uh, to go with them. And so you pour the water into the bag, the filters on the bottom and you, um, your water gets filtered so it's safe. And um, you got to have people continually going to get water to fill up those bags and to fill up the pot. Now, the soup pot, we don't filter that water. You just bring it to a big, long boil to make it safe. Oh, another job I always do, I'm always the first one up in the morning. And so I turn on the fire on the uh, big pot of water. So when other people get up, they can drink coffee and, and make their oatmeal, their hot oatmeal. And again, that's just boiled to make it safe. Okay, so the first trip I'm gonna talk about is Humphrey Basin. That was my least favorite, 
Now, there were some, I mean, it really was a great experience. Uh, I've never had a bad experience on a mule pack trip, but I think uh, I will comment why it wasn't my favorite. This is a picture at Paiute Pass, 11,420 feet, 23 feet, looking back down from where we started that day. Notice the water and the grain, it's very pretty. Now, when I got over the past and look at the other side, a little different, isn't it? It's, in fact, uh, when you walk down the Paiute Trail from the pass off to the right, uh, one of our day hikes was to Desolation Lake. Well, there's a reason it's called Desolation Lake because the landscape is pretty desolate. Now on the left side of Paiute Trail, there were some, some very pretty um, and lush areas, but um, this uh, slide shows the hike to base camp was nine miles of 2,200 feet climb from the trailhead to the pass. Now there is, there is beauty to starkness. Uh, when you don't have trees, for one thing, you can see forever. You know, you, you get that long view, which, which is really quite beautiful. Uh, this is the Paiute Trail heading towards base camp. I actually don't have any pictures of the base camp because it was, there was a nice stream running next to it, but other, you had no views because it was surrounded by trees, which was nice. So the first day hike, uh, and by the way, there's a sign out sheet and you have to say what you're gonna do. So the leader knows. One rule is no one does anything by themselves. Has to be at least two people together doing something. So that was a nine mile hike up over 13,000, almost 13,500 feet. That first day, most people did not wanna do a big hike, but three of us did. And so me and Bob and Lisa, decided to do a hike that has several stream crossings. This was one. And see, this is a beautiful area. So the whole thing, Humphrey Basin isn't completely desolate, but <laughs> half of it is. I got this great picture of, of a stag and notice the antlers aren't fully formed. They're still kind of soft and velvety. They haven't hardened up yet. And this is Lower Honeymoon Lake. It was beautiful and well worth the effort to hike there. The snow you see up on the uh, side of the mountain in the background, on our map, it said it was a glacier, but it's no longer a glacier. There's not much left of it, but there used to be a, a large glacier there. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we're, we're losing our glaciers because of global warming. So the second day hike was out to Desolation Lake. And actually, this is Lower Desolation Lake in the background. That's me in the very front there. Um, and um, it's nice views in that you can see forever. And, and that is nice. But there's no trees and, and very little vegetation. We got a lot of rain that trip. And uh, after one of the rains, just a gorgeous rainbow. The nice thing about the rains in the Sierras is that usually they come in the afternoon. So we got all of our day hikes in before it started raining. One of them, it started raining just as we got back to camp. We barely made it, uh, but we did get all of our hikes in. And this is a beautiful shot I got of a pond with um, the reflection in it. I love taking these kind of pictures. And um, this was on another day hike out of Humphrey Basin. And every mule pack trip I've been on, the leader picks out a site for watching the sunset. And starting, I think it was at Humphrey Basin, this was the second mule trap I ever went on. Um, I started telling stories because I'm a storyteller. And it kind of caught on. And um, we had one of the other participants, uh, Walter Roth, uh, was brave enough to tell a story. And uh, he did that on some later trips as well and actually has joined my storytelling group since then and has become a very good storyteller. So it's fun to watch the sunset. And um, when it starts to get dark, um, I start telling my stories. Okay, the next meal cap. Oh, maybe are there any chat questions about Humphrey Basin? 
Yes, we have quite a few questions, John. Okay, why Let's don't see. I stop here for just a minute and you can relay them to me. Why don't we um, start from the beginning here? What's, what's your recommendation regarding packing? What's the best way to pack? Is it la large, heavy duty, waterproof duffels? Um, do you have to have any interior waterproofing to, in case of rain? What do you recommend? So my duffel I got from REI and uh, it's water resistant. It is not waterproof. Um, if you remember back where you saw the mules before they were unloaded, they put a canvas uh, cover over the top of what the mules are carrying. And that is also water resistant, but not waterproof. So um, it's recommended that you put your clothes inside the inside of a plastic bag, like a trash bag, uh, inside of the duffel. So if there's a thorough drenching, your clothes will not get wet. Now, I've never had anything get wet. And one of the trips, uh, in fact, um, it was the Humphrey Basin trip. The, uh, the mule pack um, station left late to come pick up the equipment. And so they didn't get back till seven o'clock. And so they, they got the afternoon thunder showers and it was a big storm. And even then I didn't have anything wet inside. So it's not a major problem, but uh, it is possible. Uh, and just to be safe, I always put my clothes inside plastic bags. Okay. Next question for you, John, um, is there a fee for the trip? Yes, there is. And I was gonna get to that, but I might as well um, mention it now. It's on um, the slide uh, for the next one. Uh, the fee is mostly dependent on how much the pack station charges. Mm -hmm. So the cheapest one is the one I haven't talked about yet. And it was $320 that I had to pay the leader who pays the pack station, pays for the permit and um, that kind of stuff. And then you have the cost. I don't camp, I stay in a motel. That was $244 for two nights. So you had 320 and 244, and that was my total cost, plus mm -hmm. gas to drive up. Mm -hmm. But um, this Clark Lakes, Lakes trip uh, is a few years back, well, two years. And I don't know exact, but I, I think it was more like, instead of 320, it was more like 400 or 450 plus the motel. Well, actually, I didn't have a motel cost because I stayed at a friend's house in, in Mammoth. Um, but it was more expensive. The most expensive was the Humphreys Basin trip, which ended up, I think, being $600. It was almost twice the, um, the Big Pines Lake trip. So it really depends on uh, the mule pack outfitter and, and how much they charge. Hey, John, a question just came in. Is that 320 per person or for the whole group to split? No, that's per person. That's what I had to pay the leader. OK. Okay. Which I think is a reasonable cost. Yes. Next question about your bear canister. Was it a, was it a Garcia canister? What kind of canister no, was it? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy it. It was given to me. Uh, a gift canister. Yeah. Most uh, bear canisters are pretty darn similar. They're that hard plastic. You need a, a nickel or a quarter to open it. Right. Right, that that, uh, that that keyed style of lock. Yeah. Um, another question, how do you get the high altitude certification that you put down or, or how do you vouch for your altitude worthiness on the, um, on the application? Well, you, you need to list what hikes you've done and not, um, well, actually when you make the application in January, what you would do is say what hikes you did that summer. And uh, that would give an indication to the leader of what you are capable of. Of course, what you did the summer before isn't gonna help you a whole lot <laughs> in the summer of the trip. You've got to train before the trip, but it gives a, the leader an indication, at least you have some experience of hiking at high altitude. And, and it's, you know, it's, uh, you're on, it's an honor system. We, 
assume people aren't lying. Right. Or withholding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question. Uh, who take who takes care of the mules? Oh, the meal pack station. You have absolutely nothing to do with the mules. Absolutely nothing to do with the mules. That's all taken care of by, by the outfitter, the meal pack station guy. And they they come up and they set out the gear and deposit the gear and then they go back down the mountain, right? And then they come back up at the end of the trip and they collect the gear, right? Right. That's how it that's how it works. So they're not staying up there. And you, uh, the leader usually has to have a plan B because we're out in the wilderness. There's no campgrounds right. and no reservations. You have to per have a permit to be camping in the wilderness, but you have no uh, rights to reserve a place. Now, the one of the nice things about the uh, Big Pine Lakes mule pack station guy is he usually goes up, well, he's, go, he's taking people up all the time. And a day or two before we go up, he pitches a tent where he knows we like to camp just to kind of reserve it for us, which is really nice. Um, any problems with fire, especially the last couple of years? No fire, but yes, smoke. Smoke is very irritating. Uh, this past summer, and, and by the way, I, I need to clarify, um, one of uh, the San Gorgonio uh, chapter outings leaders, Kathy Viola, is also a certified mule pack leader with Angelus. But the last two years, there have been no official Sierra Club hikes. Well, Kathy has gone ahead and done private hikes with her friends. And that's why I was able to go on a mule pack trip the last two summers. And um, I've forgotten your question. <laughs> What impact the fire this last summer? Oh, yeah, yeah. So this past summer, that horrible fire up uh, by Tahoe uh, filled up the Owens Valley. And um, the third and fourth days, we had smoke up at 11,000 feet. It came up the canyon to 11,000 feet. There was no fire within, uh, what, two or 300 miles of us. But we got smoke, and it actually made me cancel one of my day hikes I wanted to do. Yeah. So that, that is a potential problem. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, Humphreys Basin, we could see the smoke beginning to encroach, but we had so much rain that it washed it out and wow. we, the smoke never reached us. Lucky. Yeah. I think that's it for the questions for now. Okay. All right. So here we are at the Rush Creek Trailhead um, for the Clark Lakes Mule Pack trip. Eight miles, 2,750 feet elevation climb to get to our campsite. And Carson Peak is in the back background. And I mentioned that because that was one of our day hikes to the top of that mountain that you see in the background with the snow on it. This is part way up on the Rush Creek Trail, looking back down. So uh, we started at Silver Lake, which is just Right, practically right next to June Lake. So that gives you an idea of where we are. Um, so I actually stayed in Mammoth with a friend and drove uh, in the morning to uh, the Mule Pack Station. Uh, and so that's Silver Lake you see down there and um, very pretty area. We passed, um, Agnew Lake, which is one of three dammed lakes that provide electricity for Southern California Edison. And I had no idea that Southern California Edison got electricity from way up this far north, but they do. This was the site for the sunset uh, with the Clark Lakes trip. And we had beautiful sunsets every single night. Uh, we also got some rain while we were there. Um, and this was where I told stories as well. So the first day hike, we hiked up to Agnew Pass, going past Summit Lake. The water was nice and calm, which made a nice reflection. This is on the other side of the pass, looking down towards Thousand Island Lake. Can't see it yet, 
And that's uh, Banner and Ritter Peaks that you see right in the center of the picture. And I can never remember which is Banner and which is Ritter. So I always say them together. This is the first view of Thousand Island Lake. Off in the distance to the right is where the lake is. There's a pond on the left, but this was our first view of it. And just beautiful weather. I, I love I love taking pictures when there are clouds in the sky. It adds a, another dimension to it. So here I am eating lunch at Thousand Island Lake. Day two, we hike to the top of Carson Peak, 10,912 feet elevation. This photo is taken near the beginning of the hike and shows Ritter and Banner Peaks again in the distance. And I just love the way they were framed by the trees and the way the clouds looked. I took so many pictures, choosing which ones to show you guys is difficult. Here I am at the top of Carson Peak with Banner and Ritter again. And now if you look to the right, about a little over halfway up, you'll see Thousand Island Lake and you can see some of the little islands in the lake from here, from this shot. From here, this is two days later, we hiked back towards Thousand Island Lake and reached a, a high point where you could really see a lot of the lake. And that shows you why they call, call it Thousand Island Lake. I don't know if there's really a thousand islands, but there's certainly a lot of them out there. This particular day, shortly after taking this picture, the uh, skies opened up and it rained all the way back. And it was like two hours of hiking in the rain which is the first time that had happened to me. So you all, you've got to have rain gear. <laughs> Always when you're hiking in the Sierras, you got to carry rain gear. Okay, the, the last mule pack trip and my favorite, Big Pine Lakes mule pack trip. Hike to base camp is eight miles, about 3,000 feet elevation climb. So we start at 8,000. We go to 11,000. The base camp is at 11,000 feet. And... Um, the cost to the leader, as I mentioned earlier, was $320 for the mule pack, two nights lodging. Prior was cost me $244, so that makes what, uh, $564 uh, for a week of spectacular entertainment. Now, we stayed at the Glacier Lodge, which shows conveniently on this map on the right, and our practice hike was up the south fork of the Big Pine Creek which was the worst of the warm-up hikes of all the trips I've been on because there's a big uh, stream crossing that's very difficult. The three years I've been, I made it across the stream once <laughs> and the other two times was not able to make it across the stream. So it ended up being a very short hike. The main hike is on the North Fork of the Big Pine Creek. And this map shows all the lakes. There's first lake, second lake, third lake, fourth lake, fifth lake, sixth lake, and seventh lake. And those are all glacial lakes. And uh, you'll see, especially first, second, and third lake really have that special color. We camped out right above fourth lake. And it doesn't show, well, it shows Sam Mac Meadow, which we hiked to. And from Sam Mac Meadow, there's a trail that hikes up that goes up to the top, well, not to the top, uh, but to the base of um, the uh, glacier. So that was one of our hikes. On the way up to the base camp, we stopped at Lon Chaney's cabin, the famous silent era actor. And Kathy, our leader, is giving us instructions of what to expect on the rest of the hike and what to do when we arrive at the campsite. And notice he chose a very beautiful spot with a stream going by. People are sitting on the steps of the cabin. You can't see the cabin in this picture. The stream is actually prettier than the cabin. And then we went through a really lush area with lots of flowers. I took this one. And this is First Lake. Notice it has kind of a turquoise color. This is Second Lake. This is Third Lake. So we hike past all these lakes. This is Fourth Lake. And we get up above. And this is the reason I like this trip the best. This is our base camp. We are looking 
at the Palisade Glacier. And it's just a breathtaking view. The photo does not do it justice. And since I'm the first one up in the morning, oops. Oh, so that night, uh, after we set up camp and had dinner, in fact, every night we go to watch the sunset. And just a little ways from where our base camp is, there's a rock ledge right above Fourth Lake. And notice the alpine glow up on the, the peaks and the reflection of that in the water is just beautiful. Now, the next morning, the sun is not up yet. Can you see the moon in the sky? <laughs> it's just that pre-dawn era, uh, the time when it begins to get light, but not necessarily direct sunlight. And to watch the colors change as the sun comes up is just spectacular. So we've got this looking very red now, right? Now the sun's starting to shine. Notice it's not quite so right. That big uh, rock on the right side was the first one I showed you. It was all that dark red, almost maroon. Now it's beginning to fade a little as it gets more light. It actually, in direct sunlight, is gray. And I went down to the, the spot where we uh, go at sunset to look at, at uh, Fourth Lake. And now that red pile of rock there, that red mountain has the sun directly on it and it's like gold in color. But if you look in the reflection of the lake, it has that red color. It's just amazing the different colors you see as the sun comes up, it's just spectacular. Now this is later on in the morning when the sun is fully up and notice it's, it's gray. <laughs> It's, it's not red, it's not golden, it's gray. And the reflection is, is gorgeous. So our first day we hike up to Sixth Lake and Seventh Lake. The second day, or sometimes the third day, we hike to uh, Sam Mac Meadow. And from there, we hike up to Palisade Glacier. Now this is on the way up, to Palisade Glacier. It starts out with a nice trail. This is looking back down at Sam Mac Meadow. And Sa the stream there is fed by Sam Mac Lake, which you can't see because it's behind that ridge up there. You see the snow going up. Um, there actually is a waterfall up there. Doesn't show here. It was a dry year this year. So I think we're still on the trail here. Notice the, the flowers. Uh, at the base of the rock, we've got shooting stars, we've got a columbine and mountain asters, beautiful flowers. Now there's not much trail left and we begin to do uh, scrambling. The one year, um, we really had a lot of snow. This, this wasn't this past summer, this was a couple, of, this was either 2017 or 2019. I've been on this hike three times. And then the rest is just boulder scrambling. So not everybody goes on this hike. It's not for everyone. It's a tough hike, a really tough hike. The first year I went, we left at 7.30 and got back at 7. So it was a long, long day. Well, I should say I got back at 7. I was the sweep. <laughs> Some people got back before I did, but I had to stay with the slower hikers. And here I am at the top. <clears throat> this picture is kind of, uh, the light kind of bleached it. Um, but that's the Palisade Glacier. This is a better picture, more definition of the glacier. And this was either taken in 2017 or 2019. I don't know which. But now I'm going to show you what it looked like this past summer in 2021. Much smaller. Let me go back. Notice how wide it is. And notice at the bottom of the glacier, there's the water, but it's covered with ice. Here, it's all melted. It was not a good snow year for the Sierras, and the glacier is shrinking anyway. 
but when we have years like this past summer, it really shrinks a lot. Still worth a hike up there to see it though. On the way back down, uh, I hadn't noticed these flowers on the way up, but I noticed them, they're very small. So I got down on my hands and knees and I took this picture up close and it's Cassiope. I looked it up on the internet. No, Cassiope, I'm sorry, Cassiope. And I have a quote here from John Muir. Here too, I met Cassiope growing in fringes among the battered rocks. No evangel among all the mountain plants speaks nature's love more plainly than Cassiope. And the common name is white heather. It's just gorgeous. On the way back down, there's a great lookout of the first three lakes, first lake, second lake, third lake, um, that we hiked by on our way up. Uh, so the one furthest away is first lake. And if you look to the left, about three quarters of the way on the edge of the screen, you can see a dark flat spot. That's fourth lake. I zoomed in from here. You can see it a little bit better. It's kind of obscured by uh, trees, but you can see the rocks there that we sit on at night right above it. The bare rock place uh, where there's no trees, that's where we go at sunset to sit. <clears throat> now, the last day of 2019, uh, everybody, not well, most of the group went back to Sam Mac Meadow and three of us decided to hike cross country up to Sam Mac Lake. That was not an easy hike. We didn't get to do it this past summer because of the smoke. I canceled the hike because it, it was not, I didn't want to do a strenuous hike breathing in smoke, but we, we had to pick our way. We knew generally where the lake was from the map, but there was no trail. Cross country means there's no trail. We had to go around this huge snowfield. We got up to the ridge and we could see the lake. Then we had to hike back down the lake is at 11,798 feet. So up on the ridge where I took this picture, it's probably uh, closer to 12,000. It's at least, another, at least another 100 feet higher than the lake is. And here I am posing for a picture at Sam Mack Lake. And there actually were, there were fish in it. I was surprised. And such a beautiful background. Then we had to hike back down. That's Sam Mac Meadow way down there. And fortunately we found a better route back down. It's always easier because you get to see the whole lay of the land. You don't see that on the way up, but when you're up high, you can see the whole lay of the land. And we chose a much better route coming down than going up. And when we got closer, uh, we could see the meadow and we made it back. And when we got back to camp, we put on our swimming suits and jumped into Summit Lake. Now, Summit Lake is not a glacial lake. Um, it's actually in a bowl. It's, it's a little valley surrounded by hills. And so when the snow, there's no inlet at all. The snow melts off the sides of the uh, hills surrounding it and fills up the lake. And as the summer goes on, it evaporates uh, and gets a little bit smaller. And because there's no inlet of melting snow going into it, it warms up. So it's a perfect lake. It's still cold, mind you, but it's not freezing like some of the other alpine lakes that I've gone into. Uh, it's actually quite refreshing to go into Summit Lake and look at the view you have. There's the Palisade Glacier off in the distance. It's just, just awesome. And I wanted to throw this picture in. This is it's a pond off of Fourth Lake, and we were hiking over to Black Lake on another day hike. I, I didn't include those pictures, uh, but this was just spectacular because the water was so still, it made a perfect mirror. And uh, it's, it's because of views like this that I, I love mule pack trips because you get to go places you wouldn't be able to do on a, on a day hike. So, Check this website in January to see what mule pack trips are scheduled for summer. You may want to write this down, uh, or maybe uh, we can type it into the chat section. Um, 
but it's www.sierramulepacks.org. So the, the Mule Packs section of Angela's chapter has its own webpage. And I showed you screenshots of that uh, early on uh, at the beginning of the slideshow. And that's where you go to find out about uh, what mule packs are going to be uh, operating in 2022. And at this point, we're assuming that there will be some. Um, not as many as usual, but there will be some. And uh, you can sign up for that. And that's the end of my talk. Let me stop the share. I can answer other questions now if they've been typed in. We have a couple, John. Um, okay. uh, what kind of uh, gear do you recommend for, for rain gear? Just the, the good old frog togs or something more substantial, more expensive? What, what do you use if, you're, out, if you're, you're likely to be out into pretty substantial rain? I always, when I'm hiking in the mountains, have <clears throat> two different kinds of rain gear. I have a poncho. A lot of times, all you need is a poncho because uh, a lot of the storms in the, in the mountains pass by quickly. And I have full rain gear, but it doesn't breathe. I mean, it keeps me dry. But if I'm hiking in it for a long period of time, I sweat like a, a horse. and um, so that's not good. So, but if it's gonna rain for a long time, I, I put on the full rain gear. Uh, and you can kind of tell uh, what the storm's gonna be like. The other thing where a poncho doesn't work, if it's extremely windy, it blows the poncho up and doesn't provide you with good uh, protection. So you kind of look to see uh, if the, the whole sky is dark uh, and of course, we look at the weather forecast before we leave, and, and usually they can, you know, give a week's forecast of what's likely. And if it's likely there's going to be a big storm, then uh, when it arrives, we put on the full rain gear. But I always have a poncho uh, just in case it's a quick passing one. That's good to know. Um, next question is, is only halfway ironic. Um, I think it's well taken. Uh, do the colors change if there's smoke from fires? I mean, so what's the impact? We're, we're, we're hearing a lot from you about climate change, obviously. Glaciers within just a few years are changing dramatically. We're, we're, we're hearing about smoke filling the Owens Valley and coming up to the 11,000 foot level. Um, what else have you seen from, from fire and the climate change and, and what should we be wary of. Is August going to be a, a really difficult time to go mule packing? Will we have to switch back earlier to June and July if possible? The bad thing about June and July is mosquitoes. Right. <laughs> That's why we don't go in June and July. Mosquitoes. Uh, and actually a drought year, like this last summer, there, were no, there was no mosquito problem at all. And um, sometimes I... Fortunately, I've never gone on a uh, trip where mosquitoes were a big problem. I've never gone in July, for one thing. Uh, the earlier you go, the more chance you have of having more mosquitoes. And they can be a big problem. Um, one thing that for sure, and the, a difference that actually is kind of cool, um, global warming has made it so that it's not as cold at night up in the Sierras. And when I used to camp at Yosemite at 8,000 feet, I love to, to sleep outside so I can see the stars. And so I bring a cot. And by the way, you can bring a cot on the mule back trip, mule pack trip too. Uh, but when I'm car camping, I always bring a cot. And every morning I'd wake up with ice covering my sleeping bag. This was 20, 25 years ago. Now, that doesn't happen. I mean, it, it doesn't, at, we were at 11,000 feet and I suspect it never got below 40 degrees. And, and 20, 30 years ago, that was not the case. So it's warmer at night. So I slept outside every night. And this year we were there during the um, meteor shower and it was just awesome to, to look up at the sky laying out there in my cot not inside the tent. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, 
suggestions for high altitude con conditioning, John. Uh, what what would you suggest for people that are thinking about this next year and, and want to get going during you know starting this winter and and, and trying to do some some high altitude conditioning? How do you do it? It's hard to do high altitude conditioning in the winter. Now we haven't had any big snows yet in our local mountains, so you could still hike. Uh, you know, do some high altitude hiking. Now, if you've never done hiking at higher altitudes, you really ought to get, get out there and try it because, um, you know, different people respond differently. It's mostly a matter of conditioning. And if you've never hiked above 8,000 feet, um, you probably should try it out and see if that's something you want to do. Um, plus, when you submit your application, it would look good. Um, so if, if we still don't have any snow this fall, you could start hiking up to higher elevation hikes. There's lots of trails in the San Gabriel and San Bernardino Mountains that'll take you up to a high elevation. And that would be good to put down on your application that you've done like Dry Lake in the San Bernardino Mountains or um, Thunder Mountain in the San Gabriels, or, you know, uh, you could list what, what uh, places you have hiked. And then of course, in the spring, you've got to start out slow, at least if you're old like me, you do. Uh, and every year it gets harder and harder and it takes longer and longer, but I can still do it. It's just a matter of conditioning. And I slowly increase the altitude of my hikes until I'm in good shape by August. Follow up on that, John. Um... Any thoughts for mule trips for folks with lesser experience or fitness? Um, nine miles at 10 to 12,000 feet may be a challenge for some. So what are your suggestions for, uh, for other mule, mule pack trips? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, you could schedule something, uh, you know, on your own, you can contact the mule pack stations and, and, and um, for instance, uh, the Big Pines area, uh, a lot of people hike up to, these are backpackers of course, but they hike up just to First Lake or Second Lake. And, and the mule packs, I know they've delivered people uh, to Third and Fifth Lake. I don't know whether, how low they go. Uh, it's, it's a problem for availability because the backpackers don't usually make it up to where we go because it's a, it is an eight mile hike and 3000 feet. And if you got a big backpack on, that's a heck of a way to go <laughs> to get, you know, mm -hmm. to get to your camping spot. And so I think that's why we chose to uh, go that high, but um, uh, I, I, I don't, you know, I have never arranged a mule pack trip, so I'm not, privy on to exactly uh, how that goes, but you could contact, you know, I did that search for different uh, California mule pack stations and got all those sites listed. Yeah, you know, a couple of things come to mind. I, I had a have a friend who uh, is a professor at UC Riverside and he always took his grad students uh, up into the mountains above Bishop. And so, yeah, he I think he did what what you're suggesting, contacted the, uh, the mule pack state mule cat company and, and and made a private arrangement for a small group the other thing i'm wondering about it i don't know if you or anyone else has ever done it um i have not is the um the yosemite high country camps where you can go up and there's like a basically a lodging uh the, the series of four or five high country camps um above tuolumne that that yosemite national park has have you or has anyone else here tonight done that? Because that would be a way to go up. You have you have lodging. You could stay for you know an extended time. I think. Yep, I've time. done I've done the whole circuit in Yosemite, the High Sierra camps. That that is wonderful. I, I would highly recommend that. Yeah. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. You only have to carry your lunch because you get fed breakfast and dinner at the High Sierra camp. So. Mm -hmm. um, you have a day pack with water and lunch, so you're not carrying a lot of stuff. Um, they have beds you can sleep in. Uh, and, and some people take their own sleeping bag as well, but 20, 30 years ago, you probably would have needed the sleeping bag, but lately the, 
I, I'm telling you, the nights are not as cold as they used to be at high altitude anymore. When I did the High Sierra camps, probably six or seven years ago, uh, Vogelsang, that, that's the highest one, it's above 10,000. I went out in the morning, you know, above 10,000, I was shocked. There was no frost. It, it was probably 40 degrees. I mean, it, uh, it just isn't as cold as it used to be. Right. Right. So that may be an answer to people. And then, and you also go from camp to camp. You can do a circuit, right? Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes you can't get the whole thing. The first summer we did it, we got three out of the five camps. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the next summer we got in, it's kind of like a, a lottery kind of thing. The lottery. Yeah. You gotta okay. be lucky. You gotta be lucky. Uh, there's also the, um, of course, maybe not now, the um, High Sierra Camp in Sequoia. I don't know if it's still available. It was Bear Paw High Sierra Camp. We went there. It's just one, but then you can use that as a base camp to do day hikes. And there's awesome day hikes. I had never hiked in Sequoia. They have glacier carved valleys just like Yosemite. It's just awesome. Yeah, we'll see if they're still there, John. I mean, my, my heart's just broken with this, uh, that canopy complex fire that just finished up a few weeks ago. It just, it's shocking. We'll have to see what happened, what's, what's become of Sequoia National Park. But anyway, um, I think that is, um, that is it for the questions that in, in the, uh, the chat. Oh, I, so, I so what yeah. kind of presentation? There's, there's one more question you kind of asked me and I didn't actually directly answer. Do the colors change if there is smoke from fires? Yeah. Um, it's awful for photography. <laughs> it's just it's just gray. Uh, uh, it didn't make sunsets better <laughs> at mm -hmm. all. Um, mm -hmm. We took some pictures, uh, sunset pictures uh, above Fourth Lake with the smoke hanging and it just it was not nearly as good looking. It, it did not improve the colors at all. It just sort of put a gray tinge to everything. It was, it was not fun. It wasn't just breathing. It was bad. Looking at it was bad too. Right. Right. John, uh, another question. I, I think I inadvertently blooped over. So my apologies. Um, will we get a notice um, when the mule pack trips become available for 2022? Is there going to be an email or anything once the trips nope. are open nope, to nope. applicants? Definitely not. You've got to, uh, hopefully you wrote down that website for the mule pack section. Check it in January. That's right. always when they post it yeah. is uh, beginning of January and the deadlines in February. So you, you got the whole month of January to submit your application, see what they have available. And like I said, it's not gonna be a full offering of like eight trips. It's probably gonna be two or three this next summer as we transition back to normal. Right, right, right. Well, John, what a, what a beautiful presentation, just lovely. Um, thank you for your commentary and your tips and the, the travelogue, it was just, really stunning country, just stunning. So uh, makes me want to go for certain, sold. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sold, I, I've done five years in a row. And, yeah. Uh, as long stunning. as I can handle the hiking and get in shape, I mean, continue right. doing it. Right, right. I, I'm, I'm seeing lots of thank yous in the, in the chat. So, so you're a hit, uh, but again, uh, everyone, thank you for attending and uh, for, for listening to this fine presentation by our own John St. Clair. Yay, John. Thank you, John. Hi, Rob. <laughs> Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank always, you. Always fun to share. Yeah. All right. Well, John, well done. So I didn't notice how many did we have at the peak? I think we had uh, eight, uh, 15 plus, maybe 18, I think so. I think we're I think still we recording. A, a nice, uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think we are. We are.